Hi, and welcome back to Weekly Dev Tips. I'm your host, Steve Smith, aka R. Dallas. This is episode 73 with guest Claudio LaSala. We'll be talking about code comments. This week's tip is brought by devbetter.com. You can find us on weeklydevtips.com as well as on YouTube. Uh, devbetter.com is a group coaching program that I run. So if you're looking to accelerate your career or grow technically, uh, check it out. There's uh, testimonials at the bottom of the page. You can see what other people think about it. Today's guest is Claudio LaSalle. You can find him on Twitter. He is a developer with Improving, and I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself now. All right, excellent. Thanks, Steve, for having me on the show. Claudio LaSalle, you have my uh, email up there, claudiolasalle at improving.com if you need to reach out to me. My blog is at lasalle.net. A bunch of the stuff that we're going to be sharing uh, this morning, I actually post about those, and actually that's uh, how we got hooked up, right? So you have your uh, blog, I have mine, and we had some similar thoughts around this area of commenting code. I'm a technical director with Improving off of the Houston office. I've been doing software for 25, 26 years, if memory serves me right. Areas of passion, object-oriented programming, solid patterns, clean code, TDD, BDD, all those kind of fun stuff all the um, stuff i like too yeah absolutely I'm, I'm very very passionate about that the tagline of my business card is what you do matters but why you do it matters much more in uh, all those areas it's all about the why of things that we do and of course i mean besides all the the, the techy stuff and focusing on software development i'm also big into keeping my hobbies like uh, making music, playing all sorts of instruments, riding a bike crazy fast, a motorcycle at a racetrack. That's a lot of fun. That keeps me fresh, you know, stay on my toes. Uh, and that's me, man, in a nutshell. All right. Um, good. So I want to switch over to the topic at the hand. All right. So I've uh, collected a, a bunch of posts uh, as we were, you know, having some conversation on Twitter about the 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 topic because it always comes up. People will always ask, so do you like uh, putting comments in code? What kind of comments do, do you put there? What kind of comments do you actually yank out? So I went back to my blog to just see you know, where it all started. So I did a search for comments on my blog and I found it's kind of cool to see how my opinion has uh, changed over time. So the first blog post on, my, on the subject in my blog dates back to 2005. Uh, and it came about because I've run into a crazy regular expression, which I, I will not read uh, <laughs> for those who are just listening. But it's one of those that just look like cartoon swearing, right? It's pretty bad. And I'm reading code and trying to understand what the code is doing so that I can actually feel comfortable and then make changes to the code. But I, I cannot do that for the life of me. That's the kind of stuff in programming that I've never cared learning really well because I'm not that level uh, of smart. I'm like, nah, that's way beyond my, you know, my skill set. And then I've learned that you can actually put comments in regular expressions. And I, you know, I asked myself, why don't people do that more often? So I remember at the time I had to ask a coworker to actually, uh, you know, just help me understand the bits and pieces of the regular expression and then drop some comments there so that later, we could actually understand what's going on without having to, you know, start parsing that mentally to understand what those things did. So that was the first one I, I blogged about. And then uh, a few years later, that was 2007, I was huge into the whole using XML comments in Visual Studio, in C Sharp more specifically. I was big into the whole, you know, let's make sure that it creates an XML file. And if we set the project in a certain way, the compiler is going to give us warnings if you don't put XML comments in members. Uh, and you can, of course, turn those warnings as errors. So I, would be, I was big into the whole, yep, if you don't have XML comments in your code, you're not even allowed to compile the thing because I treat warnings as errors. Right. So developers were not too happy with that. And <laughs> like empty you know, XML comments, which would defeat the purpose. Right. And then I've learned about, you know, FXCOP. Do you remember FXCOP? Oh, yes. All right. 
So I've learned how to write um, my own custom rules in FX Cup at the time, which was painful. If people, you know, did that back in the day, they can relate to it. It was really painful. But I did write FX Cup rules just to make sure that developers were not fooling me, just putting like XXX or whatever, you know, little comment there just to go by. Right. And I was really going through the trouble even to put XML comments in private members. Sure. Which right now it makes me cringe as I think that I, I used to think that way, right? Uh, and the way, of course, my opinion changed on that is that why put this huge XML comment for a private member? I mean, if a class is so big that you actually need to document your code that way, it's probably because the class is too big. It should exactly. be split into smaller things. Right. Right. And so if it's not okay. obvious by reading it, what it does, then exactly. you should probably name it better. Yeah, just name it better. Exactly. Right. So from there, uh, you know, fast forward to 2010, I have my IDE set up. I'm one of those uh, guys who like uh, the dark themes for the IDEs. Right. So I have the, the black. Uh, background and then the way I format uh, comments on my IDE it's not the the standard the way it comes out of the box I usually make it very ugly looking with a red background and yellow font and right. so for those, remember... for those listening let me just say like normally you know your comments show up as like a light gray so they kind of fade into the background compared to the code and in these screenshots, you can't see it, but it's just like making my eyes bleed to look at it because it's this bright red with yellow uh, that is just really distracting and annoying. So, so go yeah. ahead, Claudia. And that, thank you. Yeah, thanks for like describing exactly the way I want people to feel when they look at code, right? And I remember having a, a coworker at the time, my good friend, Alan Stevens, who looked at my screen and was like, dude, what's up with those ugly comments i said okay that's exactly the feel i like developers having when they look at at uh, comments because that's how i feel well how so well what about all those comments that are just like excuse me just code that has been commented out but kept there why is it there to begin with it has to hurt right because that's just waste that you have right there in your code right Oh, but you know, the person just commented it out because maybe we need to bring it back in the future. Well, yeah, there's a tool how for that. We had source control, mm -hmm. right? That we can use for that reason, right? Why keeping it around so that you have to tiptoe around your code as you're working with it, right? It's that to me is analogous to keeping a very messy office that you can barely make it to your computer, right? right every single day. It just makes no sense. The other point that I make with that is if somebody take, goes through the trouble of typing comments, I'm guessing that person would like to be drawing the reader's attention to that comment. So I want to make it as bright and as yelling at me so that I actually take the time to read it. Now, if I do take my time, precious time to read the comment and the comment says nothing, I am going to have a conversation. <laughs> or, or, or your delete key is going to have a conversation with that, exactly. that line. Right. But, uh, you know, the way I work, I like, uh, you know, whoever the, the developer was who dropped that comment in there, I like having the conversation. I would just not go with the machete and, you know, print right, right. out everything just because it's not the way I work. No. Sure, sure. I want to talk to the developer and say, okay, what is the reasoning? Let's talk about it. Let's see what kind of value we are bringing to the understanding of the code by dropping in those comments, right? And depending on where the person is coming from, I will coach that person through refactoring practices, you know, applying your refactor, rename, extract method. I'll coach the person and eventually the person will get there. It's like, oh yeah, darn it. I have always seen this all wrong, right? So is this so the most recent uh, post you have? Is the 2010 one or did you have more after not. that? There, there is more. <laughs> all right. So yeah, let me pull it right here and flip it over there. So there was 2017, right? I'm working on this uh, one project 
and I'm specking out, essentially doing TDD, right? And I'm specking out what kind of interface do I need for this thing that I'm implementing. And the compiler is already yelling at me because I don't have XML comments, right? And right. I'm like, okay, you're defeating the purpose of TDD. I'm not done yet. Don't tell me that I need to put XML comments for something that I'm not, not even sure if this is what I'm going to be keeping as the final implementation. But That's 2005, you wouldn't even let you compile without those things. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, this is extremely annoying. Why are we doing that? Uh, so then I use a little tool from another old friend of mine, uh, from Sergey, a ghost doc, where mm -hmm. you hit a shortcut and it puts the XML comments in place. Now, of course, what is the value of having that kind of comment? Oh, yeah, the get portfolios method gets the portfolios. Right. That, that's, that's helpful. Right? <laughs> or you get, uh, oh, yeah, there's this parameter, return if deleted. If set to true, return if deleted. Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's just noise. right? Yes. It's not helping me. And then at the time I found there is this extension called no comment, all right? And the pun intended, right? So right. I basically can activate that extension. So at that point I could conform with the company's policy of having all that eager static analysis where I like static analysis as long as I can trigger it. Now, if it keeps yelling at me as I'm doing my TDD thing, I say, no, just stop. This is madness, right? Uh I noticed in this code, these screenshots are not screaming at you in bright red with your comment uh, style. So you, you, Correct, you, because could, this you was couldn't the, do that if you were using XML comments. Uh, I think you can do that. I don't, I don't quite recall, but this was the client's computer. It didn't okay. have my setup. Okay. Right? Well, no, I'm saying you could. I mean, you could. I'm saying you wouldn't be able to function as a developer. Oh, if yes. you that on. Well, yeah, unless you activate this uh, extension, right? Yes. Just say, yeah. don't show it. Right. I, I don't want to see it. It does not add anything to me. Now, that's not to say if people are creating an API, it's a, an API for public consumption, please, by all means, use those XML document, uh, document sure, definitely. You know, in a meaningful way, right? Telling people the why you would be using that method, right, or that endpoint. But if right. you're just, you know, the get port portfolio method gets the portfolios, just stop <laughs> yeah yeah right uh and then the la or the latest one i had let's see that's, that's from 2017 is just showing people there are uh quick comments i do drop uh, in code for to do's as i'm working within a sprint right i'm creating artifacts to support the user stories that i'm implementing i'm making my my mind up to certain things and then there are things that I'm not done yet. So right. I will drop a little to-do comment and then I create a template either in ReSharper or in VS Code where I type to-do and it puts my initials and the date, mm -hmm. right? And then I type whatever then you comment, can type in, yep. Right, so that whenever I'm in the process of wrapping up for the sprint, I'm going to search for my to-dos with my initials to see what do I need to do there. Do I have like an extra hour at the end of the sprint that I can clean up the thing that I made annotations there? If I don't, I'm going to add it to the scrum board and say, okay, these are some tasks that I'm going to bring up in retro for things that I know it's there. The code is working. It's passing tasks, but I know there's a little more we can do to make it better. So we can turn that into an actionable item for next sprint, or we can put it in a backlog, whatever it is. And then I get rid of that comment. Sure. Right? So when do you decide whether something is worth a to-do comment in the code that is going to get committed into the code, at least in your branch or you know, in intermittently, maybe it doesn't make it into the master when you finally do your pull request, right. or an actual issue uh, in, in your work tracking system? If it is really a, an actual issue that I know it's going to produce either like a real slow performance because it's a query that we know it's going going to the database and doing a plus one type of query or whatever it is, mm -hmm. I will keep that in the comments, right? Uh, but I will create an issue in the tracker and cross-link that and like grab that link and put it within With the, the comment. comment. Sure. Right? Because if somebody runs to the code like, oh, Claudio left this code in here, 
man, this is a terrible query. <laughs> We're going to add context. Look, I know it's a terrible query, but here, follow this link to see all the context around the decision we've made here. Sure, that makes sense. Right? Yep. And that, that, go, that ties into how I like to use comments, which is that they should document why, not what. And so if you're wondering, like, why is this code here that looks awful here, like linking off to that issue where there's a, a longer discussion in more context just makes a lot of sense. Correct. The other thing I like about your, I haven't done it myself yet, but I may, uh, I like about your styling and having the comments jump out at you is that I don't have a lot of comments in my code. When I have them there, it's because something, you know, needs your attention, right? It's a warning. It's saying, hey, you know, don't, don't fix this because it's not really broken. It has to be this way because if you try and fix it, it'll be worse. Um, yeah. And so I want you to see that before you're like, oh, let me just fix this real quick um, and, and never read the comment. So I wanted to jump out at you. Correct. That's exactly right. And uh, I actually, I have, a, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, like here, you know, I have another whole talk on, um, what's on the call? Uh, writing clean code and uh, code reviews and how to perform code reviews. Like I said, I work with uh, developers to coach them mm -hmm. uh, into addressing this kind of issue. Like this is some code that I found in the, the wild years ago, right? Where there's a bunch of if blocks, a bunch of code that's commented out. Some are still hanging in there. And then I show developers, look, you see that here you had duplicate person as a question and then you have an if statement there. Every single if statement is always a question. It is it's some sort of question that we're asking the system, asking the context around us, and then based on that answer, we do something, right? Uh, so for those, you know, don't do that. Just change things around where you either have a method on the class at hand or a function, whatever it is, that tells you what that question is. So right. do not make me read, like on the previous slide, String equals some value, some other weird value, string comparison in varied, invariant culture. Don't make me read that because you're forcing me to do all that mental parsing to understand what that question is. Right. You have Don't to work at a very low level. Exactly. So make me read English as much as possible. Right. And if I do want to say, oh, it's duplicate address, how do we determine that? I can just F12 into that and see the actual implementation yes and now that is duplicate address is very easily tested on its own and its intent is very clear yeah, so it's exactly right so it, and it makes the calling code much easier to follow as well yeah, yeah exactly so is and, this a uh, private presentation or is this something that we could link to uh i think there is a I, i'll send you a link let me take note of that okay because i can include anything like this if you want if you have it on slideshare or something i can put it in the show notes Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, of course, for the, the sake of the, the folks who are listening to this, so the idea that instead of having an if statement that has like some whatever programming language assets you're using, like you're checking for the length of an array or you're check, you're making a call into a method, passing in a bunch of parameters and things like that, extract that into a separate method, name that method after the question that you're asking the system, right? right which makes it a lot more readable and, you know, uh, there's no cognitive friction for you to understand what the code is actually doing. Right. And, and you might have to use that in more than one place, but, you know, and then you get code reuse Correct. as well. But even if you don't, that's not the only reason to extract something out into a function. Just yeah. giving it a better name and only calling it from one place is still a worthwhile refactoring. That's correct. Right. Because, uh, I mean, and to that point, uh, if you do end up calling it from more places, it will also beg the question, you know, does this method belong in this class or should it be moved someplace else? Right. Because many times when I show this to people, people are like, oh, well, but that now is a private method. How do I write tests for private methods? And I say, well, you don't. Right. Right. Technically, you can do that. Right, you can use like in C sharp just reflection, you know, right. instantiate the class, call the method, but please don't do that. If you feel that need, it's because that method, the private method here, should really be a public method in a different class yep. whose responsibility is to do this one thing. Yep. Right. And then you write tests for that method someplace else. Sure. And we could probably do a whole separate uh, tip on how to do some of these refactorings, but we should probably wrap this one up because I try to keep these pretty short. Right. 
Yeah, so I guess just to account for two more points. One is get rid of the narrator style of uh, comments, like mm -hmm. for each of our attribute overrides, and then you have for each var attribute override in attribute override. Right. right. If the product blah 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 as the comments, and then the code says if product blah blah. blah. Yep. You know, it's like you're talking to a kid. Well, and, and maybe when you first wrote this method, you wrote all those comments to kind of guide your way, and then you wrote the code. But after you do that, get rid of the comments. You don't need them anymore. Get the code re represents those now. Yeah. And if you are following TDD, you probably don't need that to begin with. Sure. So that's actually the, the wrapping point. Like when you mentioned, you know, the putting the why on things. Uh, let me just bring back quickly to this and jump to slide. Where is the post slide, whatever. Uh, it's this one here, right? Document your, com your code with tests, right? And not tests that are your typical AAA arrange act assert, where you are showing the how the code actually functions. And then you have mock objects and stubs and spice. That does not document the code. Right, it only makes sense, only makes it sure that it doesn't blow up smoke when you run it. Instead, if you already have acceptance criteria as Gherkin, given some context when something happens, then the following happens, you can have that same test written in English, right? In a way that you can actually follow. Tests or specs written in a given when then style, working style, they document the why of your code. The right. actual test implementation will tell you the how that thing works. And the actual implementation is the what, right? What you are doing to the system to make that happen. So no right. comments. You, you just have executable, uh, you know, uh, specification there. Yep. So the, for those listening, like the code shown, the bad example would be if you have a test class called something like you know mailer tests and then a method called test send and the, and that's that's all you'll see if you run the test right if you don't actually investigate what's in it but then inside of it there's just a bunch of code um, without any you know guidance about what that code is really doing and of course the test name doesn't tell you anything it's just called test send and and the better example is have a class called sending direct mail with a method after that called send only to unique addresses and then if you look inside the test, the test just has four helper methods it's calling. Given the current user is a marketing manager, given duplicate addresses exist, when sending direct mail, then only unique addresses get mail. Each one of those is a method. Um, and so now, you know, the actual implementation code for the test lives in those other meth methods. But when you read that test, it's very clear what exact requirement it is verifying. That's it. Cool. All right. Anything uh, last that you want to share with us? Any uh, conferences you're going to or, or anything, you know, like uh, that you want to promote any books or courses or things? We're on lockdown, so I, I doubt you're doing any in-person conferences, but. Right. But I am doing a lot of uh, virtual things. Like actually, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, every Thursday, today including, I run something called Virtual Brown Bag. There is a virtualbrownbag.com website. People can check it out. It's a very laid back space where we just, you know, get up there online and we share things, you know, maybe little uh, refactoring tips that we can share with others, little shortcuts in our personal, uh, personal uh, favorite IDEs, or maybe you've run into a book, a blog post that you enjoy that sparked some sort of like conversation in your mind and you want to share that with people. That's what we do at these meetings. So I do that every uh, Thursday, uh, noon to one central time. So just check it out on the website and uh, you know, join us there. Uh, cool. If you like. All right. Well, thank you very much. This should probably go live um, this coming Monday. So maybe people will join you for next week's Brown Bag. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's it for this week. If you want to hear more from me, go to ourdallas.com slash tips to sign up for a free tip in your inbox every Wednesday. I'm also streaming programming topics on Twitch at twitch.tv slash ourdallas, uh, usually on Fridays from like 12 to 2 in the afternoon Eastern time. Thanks for subscribing to Weekly Dev Tips, and I'll see you next week with another great developer tip.